welcome to students and thank you for taking some time off in your very, very busy Saturday afternoon for walking by. So, I mean, yeah, I'm part of Houston and part of the PRC tech, tech group, and we're very, very happy to have such amazing panelists with us here today. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to our amazing panel moderator, Eileen. Oh, good at this level. One can hear me. Because if I go any longer, I'm just not coughing. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean as um she does not I'm gonna start right into it because we're kind of uh we should, right? <laughs> and I should let them do my work. So introduce yourselves. Um and while you're doing it, say that one word that you think describes comms this year. Go ahead, Adam. Oh hi, Adam Natchberg. Everyone calls me Nash. Um, I was a journalist for 25 years before becoming a comms professional eight years ago for three Chinese companies, which also makes you a ringmaster at the circus. I worked for DJI, for Alibaba, and now Tencent. Uh, the one word that describes comms this year is frightening. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Melissa. Um, I'm with LinkedIn. Uh, I come from a writing background. I used to be a, a writer and then I moved into government for a very long time. And then now I'm in tech. Um, yeah, I think one word to describe comms this year, I think we've had to be a lot more empathetic um, than, than we have ever before. Hi everyone, Grace here from uh, Endowers. So if you're not familiar with us, we are <laughs> digital, I brought my branding here. We are a digital uh, wealth platform headquartered here in Singapore. So the, the, our co-founders founded the company in 2017. So we've been around for around three and a half years. And we've recently opened up to the second market in, in Hong Kong. Uh, my personal background, I've always been in comm since I graduated. So been in different roles, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, but I think the commonality across all these different roles is that they are usually tech and startups related. So I think that's the industry and the sector that really excites me and drives me. Uh, therefore, I've stayed here like pretty much all my life, right? Um, the one word to describe comms this year, really, really tough. That's two words. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that's three words, really, really tough. Okay, tough. Tough. Okay. Yeah. So keep in mind your, your three words or one each, right? Can you maybe talk about some of the key principles that kind of drive your approach to communications? And maybe talk about how then that fits into frightening empathetic and tough. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I, guess, avoiding I, guess, you know, I, I can start first. Okay, so uh, I think the fundamentals and the key principles haven't changed very much since I, I would say I graduated. Like, you know, writing skills very much needed. But I think being clear and concise very much appreciated mm -hmm. in, I would say, my the, the sector that I'm in. Because I think most often than not, you are being uh, thrown with a lot of technical jargon, for example. And how do you want to translate all these jargon, jargony terms into something that your target audience actually understands? I think that is an art and a science in itself. And it's, and it's something that I'm always constantly trying to improve myself in. Because I think throughout the, the 16, 17 years that I've been working, right, the technology that I, I was being exposed to has changed dramatically. It started with like cloud computing before it became a norm these days. And then I had to learn about quantum computing when I was with SG in a bit, now CRISPR is there. And then um, I think right now, artificial intelligence, and then there's machine learning, deep learning and stuff. So how do you want to translate all these terms into like something that is clear, concise, simple, and, and easy for people to understand. I think that's the, the crux of communications. Uh, why is it tough? I think we can share more a little bit more later, but um, as you can tell in the last three years during COVID, the industry has seen through, has seen uh, many ups and downs, mostly downs. So I think when it's tough, when, you know, how, how, how then do you want to, uh, do you want to continue to build that trust, credibility? How do you want to maintain a, the momentum of having your firm, your brand out there when there isn't much positive news to share? So right. it's tough. Wasn't it kind of maybe slightly easy because everyone's attention is online? Um, did that help to make it less tough at all? And now it's actually tougher, I find, because there's so much more, more noise now. Everyone's back in and it's online. You're finding online, you're finding off-site off as well as social media as well. 
has that has that made it tougher now actually rather than during COVID itself? I don't know. I think it, it really depends on your personality, mm. right? Like for me, it was really tough for COVID because I was stuck at home. You know, I, I didn't do many makeup. I was just in my pajamas all the time. And it was just very tough because not seeing the people that I work with. And, you know, that's part of communication. So I need to be talking to like journalists like yourselves. I need to be talking to my partners, my colleagues. And I think that was tough from a personal capacity but if you're talking about comms wise i don't think there's a difference whether mm -hmm. it's like online or physical and, and stuff okay yeah oh. it's, it's good you got all dressed up today i know you hardly see me like that <laughs> for the first six months i actually woke up and in the in the closing then and just stayed there for like the rest of the day that was me <laughs> I'm, I'm not sharing any of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> um Alyssa? yeah uh, I think the first principle would be um, being more aud being audience centric. I think you need to understand um, your audience. Uh, that involves uh, understanding the data, so understanding their pain points, the challenges, how they feel towards certain things, um, the nuances of it. Um, and I think that what ties that together is empathy. Like you have to, you, empathy is the bridge, right? You have the data on hand. You need to know what your audience sort of feels and you need to land a message that will be received well, right? Okay. So I think empathy is what allows you to do that. Yeah. So for me, that's uh, these are the, the general principles of, of how... Who, who do you consider your audience, you know, when you're doing comms? It really depends. So for LinkedIn, personally, we have, um, you know, we have B2B comms. So we're one of the tech companies that has figured out a way to make money. Um, and sort of have like a USP or value add to the consumer as well. So B2B comms would be speaking to companies, CHROs, business leaders to help them, you know, understand their, their, their talent strategies are incredibly important that they need to um, basically think about how they structure their talent, how they upskill their talent and things like that. And then we also have the consumer audience, right? And the consumer audience is um, the, the members that use our platform that you know we need to maintain trust with yep. um, and how we operate sort of uh, very much revolves around uh, putting them first and, and maintaining that trust. And then it's the corporate, which talks about, you know, um, our company and what its vision is, how we, you know, value add. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Is there something in your notes about me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Three principles, man. Three principles. Focus. Okay. No. Um, so you kind of accept when you work for uh, a Chinese company doing PR that it's already like a degree of difficulty above regular comms now they they call it pr partially because it's like saying app or ppt it's just shorter than saying comms you know it's just pr but but i think the issue is more that it's not well understood at a chinese company you have to do a lot of internal stakeholder explanation and education so it really comes down to and this is not making fun of anybody i'm being serious now for one of the brief moments but right. um but it, it's more just like to them, it's, uh, in the, you know, when they see it done in the mainland, it's you issue a press release or you go to journalists, you tell them to take down a story that's that you're not happy about. That's the PR function. So you, you kind of spend a lot of time educating and you know that that is kind of a challenge to you to get people to think that you can offer strategic counsel, that you can actually stop things before they go over the edge of the cliff if you just talk about it first or there's strategy involved and things that you don't just kind of rush towards it or you know listen to me because I'm old and I've done this 75,000 times and I know the way that you want, want to do it won't work um but this year the added level of difficulty and this is why frightening comes in is because the geopolitical situation that was kind of bubbling up a little bit before COVID really kind of took hold during COVID and now after COVID. And, you know, we already tend to, as Chinese company comms departments, tend to be a little bit defensive in, in our PR strategy. Um, Tencent is probably behind where Alibaba was in terms of, you know, Alibaba was founded by marketers, whereas Tencent was founded by people of science and math and technology. So they're a little bit lower key and they don't talk as much uh, so it's been kind of a challenge to show them how to use content to explain mm -hmm. comps to them. But now uh, when something's happening, because there's that overhang of, you know, CFIUS or, or U.S. data privacy stuff or Europe worried about, 
you know, uh, where your servers are located, something like that. It just ends up everything becomes a lot more fraught than it was in previous years. So I'm spending a lot of my time this year, you know, deciding whether or not we should say something at all. And if we do, you know, are we in compliance? You know, have we, do we need to check anything with our lawyers first? So it just has gotten a lot tighter and a lot more frightening. I'm not sure though that it's a China thing. I think it's a, a universal thing where I don't think you're alone in figuring out that your leadership team might not understand what yeah. comms mean. I don't know if Alyssa or Grace might agree with that. So sometimes you do get that question and you go, what? Uh, from your leadership yeah, maybe it's leadership is general stakeholders that you're working with right? especially right. senior stakeholders so maybe like earlier in my career a lot of them would think that PR is just writing media releases mm -hmm. PR press release and I had to educate them that hey you know we do more than that so I think it's about building that relationship with the stakeholders enough for them to understand the value that you bring because a lot of the material or the content that I need to build a, a strong comm strategy or the materials or assets that I'm building requires all these inputs from these people. So, I mean, if they are not going to be supportive of my work, they don't feel like I'm creating that value for them to do their work well, then, you know, this partnership is not going to happen. I think particularly with technologists, because they are so used to science and tech, you're telling them, hey, you know, can you review this? piece of content and they're like why do I want to spend time like that I'm doing the important stuff why do I even want to spend time doing all these things so I think again you know to Nash's point it's a lot of education and a lot of buy-in and building that longer term I think relationship that you, you need internally yeah it makes how, work much easier how, how does then your sector kind of either complicate or make it easier so you're an internet tech but you're China as well ish um you're US and you have a tech platform that cuts across different sectors-ish. And then you're a fintech. So you have like MAS as a regulator as well. That will impact how uh, how and what you say, yeah. I, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about your principles then and how that guides your, your approach communications, how does that play it back in your head in terms of, okay, I have to do things certain, certain things differently mm -hmm. in order to, to stay alive? Mm -hmm. And, and compliant, also to yeah. stay compliant and yeah. also to uh, to keep a job as well, right? And to make sure that your company's branding also does not fall below how or be affected. So maybe talk about how maybe global, regional and local influences how your principles are being, you know, carried out in your comps. Adam, Nash? Yeah, so I would say um, there's this balancing act you always have to perform. Mm -hmm as a Chinese tech company, because first of all, we know what the situation inside China mainland has been for tech companies since Jack Ma's pawn shop speech um, in Shanghai. And you know, you're know you under scrutiny a lot. So you always have to kind of make sure that what you're saying, we're the international communications department for, I, I'm in charge of games, the video games. So um, you, you often have to check about what's being said by your colleagues in China mainland because something that you say abroad mm -hmm. can find its way back into China and piss off the regulators. And that is something that you do not want to do because it carries very serious potential consequences. On the other side, you know, what we do and what we say um, outside of China, like we also have to kind of bear in mind that we're not speaking for you know, authorities in Beijing or anywhere else, like we, you know, we're a business. And at the same time, we have that balancing act to perform that you don't want to get up the nose of CFIUS or regulators in any other countries. So that's the kind of consideration that you always have. Like, you know what the right thing to say and do is, and it makes total sense to you. However, and it seems like by making a smart comms decision, it will help you talk about your business decision. However, there might be political considerations on one continent or another that actually force you to alter what is best practice or what you think is best practice. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we have, um, I think, so first of all, LinkedIn is Switzerland. So we fly under the radar a lot of the time. I would just say that first. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we do. We do. Um, I mean, we do comply. Um, so you're quite independent from your parent company? 
Uh, yes, yes. So okay. we, we do, you know, we do have a little bit more okay. uh, leeway Room, in that okay. sense. Yeah. So we, we do comply um, in the companies that, in the countries that we operate in. Mm. Um, that's number one with regards to regulation. Mm. But I think in terms of um, comm strategy, we have this like, term called local, which is global and, and local. Um, so we have you know, we have a general direction, what we want to achieve, um, you know, the, the objectives. Um, and then we, we, we find a way to see how that works in the different markets, taking into account the nuances, the cultural context. Um, some of it, I mean, obviously, a lot of it will not work wholesale in APEC because APEC is one of the di most diverse, you know, regions in the world. Um, and that's why we have, you know, comm specialists in every um, market to sort of provide that advice and that lens, that local lens to say, hey, this is not going to land. We have to tweak this a little bit. Um, so I think that strategy has sort of worked um, so far. Yeah. Grace, you want to add something? Um, I think for me, it's a little bit different from both of the experiences, right? For me, doing comms, so I cover both mar uh, brand marketing as well as comms and dollars. So a lot of the marketing or the PR assets that we create has to be compliant because of MAS's rules. So, you know, um, it creates this, I think, a, a, a slight challenge because, you know, sometimes you want to be promoting a certain product, an investment product, and because of you know, the, the regulations that are involved, you can't do it. So I think, you know, from a marketing brand or PR perspective, you have to be a little bit more creative in, in creative in a way that allows you to still talk about the benefits of a particular product, a solution, but ensuring that you're still compliant and you're not, you're not breaking any rules. Because, you know, once we get into MAS's radar, then, you know, it's, it's not great for us. Yeah. Does, does that present... I don't know whether the last year has made any impact on the way you approach comms, but do you feel like your old and new challenges right now, have they kind of changed the way you approach comms? Like what, what's the biggest challenge for you right now and how has that changed in the past year? I joined Endowers two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that was during the, the peak of COVID. Right. And I think the markets were then still doing very well. So I mean, I'm in the business of investing, right? So naturally, when the markets are doing well, the company is doing well. Everybody's happy, the clients are happy. The, the news that we typically push out will be like, you know, positive news. We have new product launches, new, you know, uh, new app features, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're hiring massively, like we're growing so much. A lot of the new uh, the 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 that was loud. The <laughs> the what's loud. That was not the. <laughs> anyways, sorry, sorry for the online audience. Anyways, um, I think it it was uh as a team, you're working on like positive news. Yeah, you're, you're feeling happy, right? In the last one year, one and a half years, the markets were down. You know, our our uh, assets under management was not growing as rapidly. We unfortunately had to go through a round of retrenchment exercise. So I think that was really tough. It was not easy. It was very very difficult. And then I think for me, working on, you know, tougher news like that meant that, you know, it was it personally, emotionally draining because these people are, you know, your friends, your colleagues and stuff. So how do you want to be making sure that you're still taking a very prof professional stand in pre preparing all these communications, making sure that they go out internally and externally, and then, you know, still be able to be, you know, a friend and an ally to to your colleagues, yep. right? So I think that's a balance and the difference between like two years back and maybe in the last one year. Yep. Uh, Nash, any major changes in the last past year that, I guess for you, it, things are a little easier a little bit. It was tough, I think, two, three years ago for a lot of Chinese tech companies, but you're starting to maybe see the light end of the tunnel right now, I, I, I think. <laughs> well, maybe you should have my job. <laughs> Not true. Tell us, Nash. No, so the thing I noticed, so, so I'm working for a unit that basically operates completely outside of China. Uh, I, I had to form my team during COVID. They're all directors or higher, and, and so I'm managing managers all around the world. I think what was very hard was um, more that you had to kind of, it, it was, it had nothing to do with authorities per se. It was more inside the company just uh, trying to build relationships when you can't go visit the mothership and and, and right. meet all these people and build up personal relations with them. And I think now since February, pretty much, when overnight you started to be able to, to travel back to China, 
we just have a steady cavalcade of people going from Europe or North America or here to there. And I feel like the lights have come on in terms of when you ask for something, now you're trusted, you're believed in and things like that. So it was always okay from the outside, but I think it was the inside that was more of the barrier. Okay. That's getting better. It, yeah. <laughs> you want to add any answer in terms of challenges for you? Um, I think I agree. I agree with what you said about um, layoffs. It's been a very, very difficult um, time last year. But I think in terms of, I think comms is a very versatile um, function. I think it, it's every industry, it would, you know, the skill sets are the same. You can move industries. You just need to understand the context, the history, um, you know, the environment that you are operating in. So I think that's one benefit. Um, or one plus, I suppose, of being like a comms professional. It's right. quite a versatile sort of job scope. And you could also learn from the mistakes of others, right? So yeah. if, if you look at the, the, yeah. the past, I don't know, 10 months, what's the biggest, you know, <laughs> Facebook moment that I'm like, whoa, I'm glad that's them, not, not me uh, situation. Anyone um, step at this? I, I... <laughs> I like my you, I like my job, so I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about it from a company standpoint, yeah. but I will um, share a personal experience maybe. Um, you know, uh, some time ago I had a had a colleague who was uh, leaving the company uh, right after you know a round of of layoffs, um, and that person was you know um, came to me with with a with a concern that um, they didn't want to sort of. Um, be associated or didn't want anyone to think that they were leaving as a result of the layoffs. Mm -hmm. And I think in their their post that they made about it, they they explicitly said that in a sentence. I almost died. <laughs> I really almost died. I looked at it and I was like, are you for real right <laughs> now? Okay. Um, so that was I think one of my biggest like face palm moments in in like the last few years. I think when because, it comes to comms, then how would you have dealt with that situation if I mean, someone did that? You don't have to say, oh, I, I told the person you cannot, you cannot say this. You yeah. need to take out this entire sentence. And sometimes, you know, less is more. You don't have to explicitly sure. say everything that's running through your mind, right? right? You can cut it down to like a word, like yes or no, or, you know, okay. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Grace. I've been watching the whole... I said this in some communication with you guys by email. I think the whole era of tech bros is dead. And I'm, I'm trying to... Dying, think. dying, not dead yet. Well, I'm trying to be dying, yeah. You have to explain what tech bros mean to the so, so, uh, email. So I'm just trying to see, like, who's old enough in this room to remember, you know, like the early 2000s, you know. With, of crypto bros. But we, <laughs> we, we had the, you know, the these tech companies rushing to market after 18 months flush with VC cash, yeah. no real business plan, no path towards profitability. And they're just selling everybody in these amazing valuations. And I was looking at it as a journalist going like, I can't believe this, you know, pets.com, these other things. like there's no business plan. So I covered Chinese companies privatizing like Qingdao Brewery and Qingling Motors and stuff like that. That's how you kind of, private that's how you take a company public but you you privatize it in china and then you take it public outside of china but mm -hmm. but it's like they have assets and know-how and ip and these companies would be like an app or a platform or something like before there was really an app thing it was like that's just the way they were they were websites or portals this time around i mean i've been watching this whole twitter or x thing with fascination because we have a guy who's never created anything on his own. He's basically taken over other people's companies behaving badly. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep hearing how, you know, Steve Jobs and, you know, all these other guys were going to save save the world. But they're just like the, the guys from turn of the 20th century who had the vision to spread the railroad across America. Like, it'll make it fast and easy to get across and goods can go across there. And then they ended up taking over land from eminent domain and, they got rich, you know, the people working on the railroad, not so much. And I, I think what's happening now is when you look during COVID, and I'm not being a radical here and saying this, I'm, I'm coming to a point, which is during COVID, how many of you added a billion dollars to your wealth? Raise your hands. I, I mean, when everyone is sick, dying, losing their houses, why is it that the richest people in the world are getting richer and richer? And most of them happen to be tech people. So it was a little bit crazy for me. I think now there's the wake up call because we have the post COVID hangover and people are losing their jobs. Now I had a whiff of this 
because of the way Chinese tech companies have under come under scrutiny inside China the last few years. When I was at Alibaba, you know, moved over to Tencent, same kind of the same thing. I think there's just a moment of reckoning with authorities. I mean, just before I came here, 44 states in the United States are suing Meta and Google and a couple of other companies for addictive technology. So tell me, you know, you say dying, but I, I think how we look at these guys and women, mostly white guys, though, saving the world, you know, for the next hundred years, I think we don't believe that anymore. And I, I think that's the, the challenge that we have as comms practitioners is we're working for these companies and for these guys, and they're not bad guys. It's just, you know, right now the pendulum has swung against them. So I, I just, I think that has changed the way that we have to tell our stories because nobody wants to hear how you're going to light up villages across Africa when really what you're doing is buying super yachts. You know, that's, so that was a rant, but. <laughs> <laughs> to take value of the rant, how does that mean for you as a comms person? Right? So you don't always choose your boss. You don't always choose yeah. the clients that you represent, especially for the agencies. I do feel you sometimes. Yeah. The products might be crap. Um, but you still have to sell that product to a, a journalist. But it's not even the product is crap. When you have an Alibaba, for example, a Taobao, Taobao is vital to so many Chinese now. Alibaba made it that way. And, and you've got to give Chinese companies respect in this sense. They built everything by themselves. You may argue that they copied, they stole, they borrowed, but you know there was nothing. They didn't have, they couldn't afford cybersecurity or cloud stuff when they were ready. They had to make their own services with their own UIs. They started from scratch, right? So now, as the accounts practitioner for these companies, I want to point out, we built WeChat, right? Um, you know, Alibaba built Taobao. Like, the, these are things that are just gigantic, and people rely on them. And the e-logistic e system that, that Sainiao has for Alibaba is amazing, right? So, and, and we do things with technology that does good for people. It's just, I think before there was this halo effect that was just kind of assumed and you could kind of go out there and just say pretty much anything about that and people would believe you. Now you really have to pick your spots and show that you're helping with climate change, that you're helping with other things. It's specific activities and spends and investments and commitments that you're making to go carbon neutral rather than just, you know, vague terms of tech being a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just talk about the, the worst case scenario then that you don't want to ever have to deal with at your company as a comms person. Do you have that one case scenario where, oh, probably can't and, talk about it here. Oh, gee. <laughs> well, it hasn't happened. I'm assuming it hasn't happened because it's your worst case nightmare scenario that you don't want to ever happen to you uh, as a comms uh, person. No. Nah. Nah, I don't think Man I can share it here. Man <laughs> anyone? Just imagine. So, <laughs> or if you look at the industry, you know, like yeah. someone that, if there are anyone from WPP here right now, I'm sorry. Or if you're from DBS, I'm sorry too. If you had a series of breaches, you had a series of outages, you have executives who are charged with bribery, how do you then try fine. to craft a message to try to kind of go into crisis management mode mm -hmm. but still come out at least as as high as you can under the circumstances what what's your like step one step two step three to do when something like that happens to you i think it's not um i think it's we have a we have a belief in linkedin and that is um the truth right so mm -hmm. you start from a place of truth um and then you try to explain it as best as you can um to people right um, sometimes the truth is really hard, um, like the, the layoffs that we have seen. Um, you know, we have we have um, data scraping issues, um, these kinds of things. We tend to be very, you know, factual and, and upfront about it. These kinds of things, there's no there's no pretty way to sort of tell people. We just have to say, you know, this happened. We're taking measures to rectify the problem. Um, and we often find that the, that kind of sort of straightforward, um response lands better because people feel like hey at least you know i'm getting you, you're being honest mm. with me um so you would probably have a very different um i was just looking over i wasn't that was disgusting that's <laughs> probably a very different so let's not ever making eye contact <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's that's in yeah. general how we we try to sure. sort of approach it. And I also feel like, 
you know, um, we were just looking at the, the Edelman barometer the other day, um, and we were looking at how consumers or the audience sort of expect more of private sector companies these days. Um, it's not just governments, which is which is to me, you know, strange, but they expect more of private sector companies, they expect them to help them maybe upskill, for example, you know. So how do you place yourself then in a position where, yes, you are making money, you're doing well, um, but also you are trying to sort of contribute and help. And I think those two things, um, it's very hard to find a sweet spot and, you know, but they're not sort of um, mutually exclusive. I don't believe that they're mutually exclusive. They sure. can exist. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> People are generally forgiving customers, whatever, if you're, as you said, you know, basically what you said, which is communicate with them, tell them things, tell them what's happening. They don't, you know, most people just want to know, you know, if they're affected by it, how long are they going to be affected by it? When is it coming back? They don't need to know every technical detail. You know, when we have a server outage because AC goes down or something like that, we don't even need to tell them that. We'll just say, we apologize that, that this happened, you know, and we're working on it. We're going to keep communicating. We'll keep the channel open you know, stay tuned to this stuff and, and let us know if something is really impacting you or bothering you. I think it's actually the low tech stuff that worries me more. Like you remember the story of JD.com, the founder charged with rape, you know, yeah. because the thing is you don't really want to defend somebody like that, you know, and, sure. and your job is to defend somebody like that. And what you do is you try to create some distance between, and it's hard with a Chinese company that, you know, is very tied to its founder, right? You know, um, I think you try to create a little bit of distance between the person and the, the company and the actions of the two. Um, you know, same thing, if, if there's corruption or something like that at the company, what you really want to do is you want to show the public that you take it seriously, that nobody is above being investigated and being handed over to proper authorities. So you, you have to come out and say that. So I think the low tech stuff, the character issues, mm -hmm. the human fallibility stuff is what worries me more. You know, HP going through a Wall Street Journal reporter's garbage and their head of comms at the time didn't even know about it. I mean, I, it's, I know him and he told me that. So it, it's a little bit scary when you come into the office and discover that you know, your board has been very naughty and didn't tell you that. And it's it's a really like character flaw on the part of your board that's supposed to be overseeing things for your company, right? I think it's especially difficult when uh, people see the founder or the CEO as the company. So when something bad happens with the, you know, the chairperson or the CEO, then naturally, especially if you're an enlisted company, then your share prices are going to tumble. So it's where people start talking about ESG and succession, right? It's, yeah, I guess. But there's also the, the issue with greenwashing, right? So I, I think yeah. you don't want to go into ESG because it is a marketable theme, but you should go into it because you truly believe in it. Yeah, but yeah. if you have a plan out already, and that, I have to give a lot of credit to Alibaba and Tencent, same yeah. thing. They came out with ESG plans and Alibaba already had a succession at the top. I, I think, you know, Companies are like people. They generally don't last more than 100 years. And it's because once you get a couple of generations in of leadership, uh, you kind of lose the original plot and markets change, but companies don't change as fast. So, but I do think that, that having that document that has your values out there mm -hmm. and, you know, it sort of means that whoever is in charge, you know, they're a guardian of those values. And, and that's kind of what you want to do when, once you get past the founder. Mm -hmm. How do you then, who do you find more challenging to deal with? Your leadership team, your <laughs> shareholders? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> We're going around the world. The team may have policy in its like, title. So like, leadership team, your, your shareholders, you know, your business line, product managers, your uh, journalists, the, the a-hole ones like me, um, <laughs> the human audience, the human content con creators, and now the AI-powered content creators. Who do you find the most challenging to deal with these days? It depends on, I guess, the, the organization that you're in, right? Mm -hmm. So I will not be naming companies or the people that I'm working with, but I think, I think to my earlier point, you need to get buy-in from all these different stakeholders that you're working with. It could be like media friends like Eileen, for example, uh, the leadership, as well as the business units uh, owners, as well as the directors for these business units. Because ultimately, your job is to make them look good. I think for lack of a better word, right? Look good, the brand look good. Uh, we can position the product well. If they don't 
feel like you are value adding to their business or their KPIs, they're not going to be working with you. So I wouldn't say that there would be a certain category of people who would be more challenging to work with. But I think ultimately it is your job to be able to get that buy-in uh, and be able to work on, on a partnership model with all these different people. So I think for me, uh, I, I manage an in-house team, right? But we, we work in extension uh, with PR agencies. So in both Singapore and Hong Kong. So likewise, I think, you know, you want your agencies to feel like they are part of your team. You know, they, they feel vested in whatever you're trying to achieve. And I think that's very, very important in a client agency kind of relationship. So, yeah, so I think that's something that you have to manage throughout your life, regardless of the companies that you're working with. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I agree with that. I think um, in general, humans are hard to, you know, work with um, in general. <laughs> um, but I also think that if you come from a position where, if you start from a position where nobody is actually out to get you, right? This is something that um, that someone said to me a long time ago. Um, no one is actually out to get you. No one is trying to, um, you know, make you stumble. They just have a very different viewpoint um, on what they're, they, they are very different set of challenges. And that is based on their function, their role, where they come from, their department, their team, what they look, how they look at things. Um, and I think the, the ultimate goal is to try to find a solution that takes into account um, your challenges and theirs. You know, a solution that that makes everybody sort of say, okay, I maybe I'm not 100%, like, I can buy into that 100%, but maybe 70, 80%, I'm okay with that. And everyone is, is all your different stakeholders are fine with that, then you run with that. Um, yeah, so I, I once, I, I saw something long time ago that said, like, you know, problem solving is actually a mm -hmm. function of intelligence. It's, it's, uh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Nash is trying to. Nash, you wanna? Oh, uh, so I mean, first, the easiest people to deal with these days are the media, and it wasn't always that way. <laughs> I don't think some of them are. <laughs> no, and, and I'm saying this because you know I spent a lot of time as a reporter and editor, and what I notice now is, it, and, and I still, you know, I have my free Evan button, which I'm not wearing right now. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm a storyteller, mm -hmm. no matter what I am. And, you know, no matter what my job is. But these days, media, it was dying when I got into it 30-something years ago. And it's still dying. It's been the longest death swoon I've ever seen, you know, staggering around, swirling around the bowl. And, and it's still there, but it's now populated by a lot of people who are really under, they're, they're outgunned in those cases. And I sort of relish an opportunity to work with younger journalists and kind of they'll come in guns blazing about a story, but it's because they don't understand some stuff. And if they're willing to listen, they'll get access over time. And I think that's kind of how I play it. And if they're not, then I'm totally into psyops, you know, and, and I mean, because I know what they need and I know how, how they're working. And I know how they think because I was one of them. And, you know, I, I won't be a huge help to them. Um, the hardest people to deal with, and, and this is the sort of thing that I mentioned at the beginning, is executives at any company, and the ones I've worked at, especially Chinese companies, they get it. They see the big picture. They kind of have a vision. Jack used to say things like, let's land a colony on the moon. You know, visionaries. They really want to do big things. But then you have the execution layer. Uh, which is kind of like general managers, managing directors type. And I think they are very, very, at Chinese companies, transactional and ROI driven. And I think the issue that you have there is because what you do doesn't directly contribute to their KPI, which is the biggest set of initials you ever get at, at a Chinese company, KPI for everything, mm -hmm. um, then you're just a nuisance. And especially we're involved in things like compliance process and stuff like that. Sometimes we even hold them back from success. So winning them over is kind of the toughest day-to-day -day thing that my entire team globally has to do because we have to sort of be wallpaper. We have to be support. But a lot of times we have to be very strategic, proactive, and in their face and I think that it's it's a very hard, um, very fine line to walk. Are there any must-have tools now that you use, though, to help with your um, walking on the fine line? Being old helps a lot because if you've done that, <laughs> you guys are laughing, but, you know, you get some built-in respect and, and trust at a Chinese company because you're 
everybody's uncle, you know? So for the younger communicators, for the younger communicators, what tools should they have to I, so I know the communicators? What you have to do is you have to help them get some quick and easy wins. Once they see that when you put your mind and your back into it, you can help them achieve their ROI, their KPI, whatever it is, um, they will listen to you. And they'll actually start coming to you because when they get praised for something that actually you help them accomplish and publicize, then they want more of that. Okay, thank you for answering that word. I'm completely like, unashamed to say ChatGPT is my best friend. It's constantly open on my browser. Um, it writes all my first iterations. Does it hallucinate? Sorry? Does it hallucinate? Uh, no. Okay. No, so she's just... using the paid version. So it's ah, okay. Yeah. okay. I invest. For, 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 things that, yeah, for things that I believe in, I invest. Um, yeah, so it's very, it's been very, very helpful. So you me. use it to... Everything, 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 every and holidays, like it, you know, helps me. Like, I need to draft PR messages, yeah, releases, yeah. narratives, plans. I'm like, please do this for me, and it does. Um, and then I, of course, but of course, I have to go in and it's never perfect, right? So, you have to lend your particular lens on things and make it better. Um, I was just telling Nash that uh, just now that it either goes two ways, right? So sometimes when you're stuck and you don't know what to do, um, it, it can either give you an option that you say, mm, this is not the direction I want to go in. And then you know what direction you want to go in and then you do that. Um, or it gives you a pretty good first draft. And you're like, mm, I can build on this and then I will, you know? So for me, that's um, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I think I'll just add on Nash's point earlier about working with media. So I think the best advice that I've ever gotten uh, from a mentor when I was interning 18, I can't remember, 19 years ago was that, you know, when you are pitching to the media, you go to that, you go to them with an angle or a story that you know they will want to carry. You know that their readers will want to read. Because I think most often, then, I, I've seen it, like, you know, in, in, in some of the work that we've done, right, like, you know, sometimes you would call up the media and say, hey, you know, I want to pitch a story. And it's not a story. So then, you know, how do you want to, again, uh, from an internal comms person perspective, how do you want to explain this to your stakeholders and say that, hey, you know, this is not a story. There's no way I can pitch this to the media. And they have to understand it, right? I think maybe, you know, from an agency's perspective, how do you then want to, you know, work this through with your client to say that, hey, you know, maybe we can refine this. Let's work, work on a better angle. And then we can try to pitch the media again. Because you want to be helpful. You want to make sure that you are making the, 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 the job of a journalist better and you want a good story to run. So I think this is a very, I mean, it's one of the best advice I've gotten since I started work. If you're talking about technology tools, I do use ChatGPT as well, but not so much from a writing perspective. I do it, I use it a lot for research. So just last week, we ran this uh, conference called Endowed Software so Conference. You can check it out. And it ran across two days and there were like 12 different panels. And the, the panel topics varied from personal finance to the future of family office to like, uh, there, was a, there was a panel on AI and deep technology. I think I'm not power, um, I, I don't understand all of these topics really, really well. So I think, you know, ChatGPT really, really helped in, in creating the first cut of the research, helping me to sort of like shape the synopsis for each of the panel and then the questions for the, for the speaker. So I think that's very, very useful. Um, another tool that we use, not so much on the comm side, but on the creative side, you can check this out. It's called pencil.ai. So it is a visual creation tool that helps you to, especially if you're in e-commerce or in a business where you need to be generating creatives and visuals on a, not just visuals, but copies as well on a very, very rapid basis. You need to be doing experimentation and stuff, and that's a good tool to use. You never yeah. chat GPT and ask, how do I pitch a story to Eileen that she would definitely want to cover? I have pulled out your bio via chat GPT. Uh, it's very yeah. inaccurate though, the bio. I've tried it before. It's from 2021. <laughs> yeah, well, we can talk about that offline. <laughs> <laughs> how does your then communication communication game plan change um, depending on the, I guess, the audience that you're targeting? You're trying to, I don't know if you're, you, you do target different audiences depending on the message you're trying to get across. So how does it change, you know, when you're trying to, okay, you have a task to do and then you have to write out a messaging or a PR or something or another. Mm -hmm. How do you, the chat list that you go through, right? How does that change in terms of the target audience, the messaging, the purpose, the objectives? So 
I mean, my my secret weapon, like I haven't been a comms professional for a very long time. It's only like eight and a half years. Um, you know, I tell stories. So for me, content is kind of the secret weapon. And I would say, luckily, you know, Chinese companies, when I come in, they, they're they open. So first thing I do is I build a content hub and it becomes, it's our owned platform, our owned mm -hmm. channel. And I stuff it full of great content, video, articles, but not thumb sucking propaganda pieces. It's stuff that you probably can't or won't find. Like in Alibaba, for the longest time, there was hardly any information about Huma, the sort of um, local supermarkets that would deliver in 30 minutes or something. You know, it was just a big deal, but you couldn't find it if you're covering Alibaba or covering the supermarket industry or retail. It just wasn't there. But if you went to our content hub there were about 10 stories and none of them were like fawning they were all factual and they were all interesting so now what sort of happened is both mobile and and um you know desktop or laptop is uh the way websites are being designed you can kind of have a home page that offers a different journey to different types of people who come in like you know the redesigned 10 cent group homepage. Now, if you're an investor, there's something that takes you over into investor relations. No longer is it kind of, you have to search through the pull-down menus, but you basically, your whole journey starts on the homepage, no matter whether you're an investor in Tencent or you're interested in WeChat or products, but your journey kind of takes you in different directions throughout the site because of faster, you know, better latency, um, you know, better design of, of websites. As I would say, like, from the owned perspective, at the very least, we're, we're more in control of our channel and our messaging to the different uh, audiences than before. And for the earned stuff, you're talking mostly about mainstream and niche media. And I would just sort of put a line down too. For us, for games media, we don't really have to explain background and context to them. Their readers want to go really deep in the weeds. So we do things with them, like we, we go very deep into developer interviews and kind of look at how you use AI in a game, for example. And then for the mainstream media, it's more kind of primers uh, and background and context that's kind of before you're allowed to talk to one of our senior people, you need to know all this stuff. Okay. Uh, Lisa or Grace? Um, I guess for me, the fundamentals will still be the same, right? Being clear, being concise, don't be jalani, you know, explaining certain things that you know your target audience can understand. Maybe for me, the comps that we typically do at it, typically do at an hours is split into like two uh, pillars or two main areas. So B2B comps. So we talk a lot about industry collaborations and partnerships. We, uh, and for this side of the business, I think we have to be a little bit more creative, right? Because you don't have, I'm not going to be having a product launch every month or every quarter. So then how do you want to maintain a momentum, making sure they're still in the news, your brand is still out there, people are still talking about you. So I think there are different ways in which we can do that. So I think that's more from the B2B side of things. Consumer, P consumer PR is a little bit more interesting and more exciting because you're talking to end consumers. You're talking to you know, investors who may be interested in using your platform. So again, you know, it's, uh, I would say, more fun. You, know, you can work with maybe content creators. You can be working with uh, different media partners to, 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 um, uh, to run certain initiatives or programs that can speak to this group of audiences. So I say, I think you have to be putting on different caps, right, when you're talking to the, these two different uh, groups of audiences. Yeah. I think the, for me, the game plan doesn't change. It's sort of like, a, it's sort of like a template, right? You start from the target audience, you understand what it is that, um, you know, they need to, you want to say to them, um, and why, why it matters, why it should matter to them, I think is, is very, very important. Um, and then sort of uh, finding ways in which it would land the best. Um, for example, if I'm talking to Gen Z, it would be a completely different channel, um, completely different messaging than if I was talking to maybe a business leader, for example, right? Um, so I think having that, you know, step-by-step -step process um, when it comes to the different target audiences is, is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. How are we doing for time? We're good? We're good. I think okay. we can go for another 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, um, we should try to. Okay. <laughs> we should. Okay. I want to leave some time for QA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Start yeah. Start yeah. Q &A. But <laughs> before we start QA, <laughs> at least let's try to answer that question, right? So, in terms of tech, a tech reset, 
how do you want to see that play out? And then, uh, I guess the next year or so, as a communicator, as a someone that does comms, how do you want to see the if you want to reset the whole industry, right? How do you want to do it? How do you want it to play out? I think for me, because um, my, my company is still very young, we've been around for less than five years, so we're still considered like you know a tech startup. So definitely, again, you know, the last few years have been have been really tough. For next year, 2024, I hope that, you know, the, the markets will turn. Uh, there should, that hopefully, there will be more confidence in technology companies, more funding and money is uh, invested into technology companies because they believe in not just the company's vision, but I think the, the road to profitability is important. I think to Nash's earlier point, again, you know, it, 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 these VCs are no longer just betting on companies because of the founders, right? I think, you know, give it five, 10, 10 years of, 10 years back in Silicon Valley, right? A lot of these founders are getting money because of their personality. They can sell. They're good salespeople, but what is their growth plan? What is what is their road to profitability? They wouldn't be able to see it. So I think VCs are definitely much more picky with the companies that, that they want to be investing in. I hope that the, um, well, and ours would be one of the companies that they would be looking at to invest in in the, in the coming years. Yeah. Alisa? Hold up. Um, <laughs> I <can't say. laughs> this is a it's a very difficult question with a lot of implications. Um I think we're in for a longer tech reset. Um actually I think the the projection doesn't look uh fantastic, but maybe we can hope for sort of a softer landing. Maybe we've maybe the, the worst. We've seen the worst. This is optimistic side of him. Maybe the, the we've seen the worst um, okay. in terms of payoffs and. Mm -hmm. But I also see a lot of opportunity, uh, in terms of Gen AI now that it's given us a sure. lot of opportunity and, I think people are generally worried about how that will impact sort of their jobs and their careers, um, so I guess the the end game is to see people get more comfortable with that, find new ways to pick up skills. We talk a lot about skills at LinkedIn. Um, and I think reach a place where it's not a, you know, tech was not going to replace um, humans in that sense. Yeah. Uh, from a reg regulatory standpoint, what I'd like to see, don't know that it's going to happen, is more of a principles-based system as opposed to a rules-based system, because you're always going to be running behind tech companies when mm -hmm. you do that. I like the way the London Stock Exchange holds you up, you know, you should have known better, even if it wasn't expressly against the law um, from a founder and, and, um, and a VC type standpoint, what I would say is, I think the tech reset needs to be just de-emphasize the tech. Um, I, I read, I'm an investor as well and an angel investor, and I read a lot of um, pitches every week. And the one thing I keep telling some of these founders are stop calling yourself a tech company you're a recycling company. You're not a tech company. I get why you want to be a tech company, but trust me, you're never going to get the ROI. You're just going to be a good, solid company. Um, and then from the last thing I would say from a consumer standpoint, because we talked about changing values and expecting more from the private sector, totally agree with that. I think it's sort of time for tech companies to start showing that they have some skin in the game. And what that means is I don't want to hear Uber say, oh, we're just a tech platform. It's like, no, you're not. There are people behind the wheels of cars. As much as you're trying to get all the people uh, you know, out from behind the wheels and have automatic you know, auto-driving cars, you know, but, but really start to be more humanistic about what you're doing and, and, and just understand insurance, medical stuff, you know, uh, be, being humane, don't knock people down for taking too long in your in your warehouse. Um, just this real sense of um, what you're doing is not saving the world when you're making people lose their jobs or lose their humanity or lose their health. I'm curious though, have, having said all that, that, you know, so if you look forward, obviously AI is gonna be, be around for a while, at least for next year, Gen AI. Yeah. There are two, two, um, camps right now fighting for AI leadership. I'm mm -hmm. trying to be very diplomatic, as yeah. we can tell. Um, from two different regions who are trying to, to be a leader in AI right now um, that are from different parts of the globe. Yeah. 
<laughs> you will try that. Thank you. I just want to say that. Okay, so we have two leaders now trying to buy for the AI leadership, right? But and we all know that it's going to be a bit of a tension with there. But how? I'm not going to ask you who do you want to win this race because that'll be just plain cruel. But I'm <laughs> I'm going to ask you though, how do you think or what the eco like the the game to play out in terms of AI? For the betterment of the entire ecosystem that we're going to move forward into, and also for world peace. Can I just say something very quickly on this? Go ahead. Real simple and straightforward. In this case, I think the discussion to be had is not your chip or mine or your approach or mine. It's more espousing values about ethical ethical AI. Is kind of, I don't know what else to call it. But if we could all agree on that, that then it doesn't matter whether it's yours or mine, it's kind of ours. So, it, you know, whatever you might want to use with your products, services in my market, please know that it won't be putting your people out of jobs or move jobs over to my country or something like that. I, I just feel like the protectionism happens because we're afraid our own people are going to lose money, lose jobs, lose the, our country's going to lose the edge. So that's, I, I sort of feel like you almost need to have that sort of round table discussion, not about the technology, but about how it's going to be used. Like a UN round table discussion. Kind like of. Every yeah, or, or just, you know, why, why do we have these rules for prisoners of war and things like that? Sure. It's the same, or how you conduct war, you know, it's that's the way it should be. Okay. Anyone else want to? I guess competition is always good, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's for the betterment of the industry as a whole. So naturally, I think they see this as a ammunition that they can, you know, hold. But ultimately, I think the, the, the beneficiaries of this competition between the two sides will be end consumers. So I think all, the, the, all in all, the consumers will benefit. Okay. Yeah. I have no comment. We can't fly. <laughs> the laws of the... <laughs> yeah, no As comment. we all should comply. Yeah. Okay. Q and A time. Anyone? Yes. The mic, the mic's coming to. Hi, I'm Devika. I'm from Karma, and um, I really picked up on a point you guys wanted in Australia. It was really cool. Um, we talked about prices, about, uh, connecting with Gen Zs, for example. So. To what extent, how are you guided by your instinct and how are you guided by best practice and other best in cases? And to what extent does data come to that decision? I guess for everybody. I know for games, we skew younger. So it's not quite Gen Z. The, the consideration that we have is a lot of the games that we do are games as a service. So they're mobile games, they're downloadable, free to play. Um, the people who have the disposable income um, are the ones who you really are kind of targeting in a sense because they're the ones who bring in the revenue for you. However, the general rule is the best games are the ones that offer the best content and the best experience. So I think we skew in, in, in that direction. Like it doesn't, you know, this isn't a Gen Z game. It's not a woman, a game for women or a game for men. It's, it's a great fun game that you want to play on the subway with, on your phone. Um, and, and when we talk about it, we don't sort of change our presentation for Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, et cetera. Yeah, for us, I think financial literacy is a big area that we focus on. So yes, we are an investment platform. But I think for us, we believe that for somebody to be able to invest better, they do not, they need not just a technology platform, a good one, but also that knowledge that you need to acquire because ultimately you need to be able to make that uh a uh, good decision for yourself whether you're investing well or not. So we've actually invested a lot into building our financial literacy content hub. So I mean, you can check out our website. So it ranges from insights articles to uh, reports to social media posts, uh, all the way to like video, uh, video content and so on and so forth. So I think to your point, whether we are tracking the performance of all these articles, as well as the assets that we, we, we create, the answer is yes. Now, obviously, you know, it's an iterative process, right? When we first started, I haven't, I've not joined them back then. I think they, they spent a lot of uh, time writing like super, super long articles, very, very insightful. But then you know that the drop off after two scrolls, people don't read the articles anymore. So then, you know, what else should you be doing to, to ensure that your content is actually reaching the target audience and they are, uh, they are consuming it to their benefit. So I think that's the learning that we got in Singapore. Singaporeans, interestingly, still read a lot of articles on personal finance. 
moving to Hong Kong, we had to take a different approach. Hong Kongers are very much driven by video content. So everything has to be visual. So then, you know, uh, our approach, our strategy for content curation and creation in Hong Kong would have to change. Yeah. Penny, uh, oh, you want to go? Go ahead. Hi. No? Okay. <laughs> you just sigh a relief. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone? Any, oh, yes, go ahead. All right. So, um, hi, my name is Mariel from Precious Communications. Um, I think there's there's a lot of interesting points that were brought up. You know, you mentioned um, tech jargons, you know, internal stakeholders management, right? I guess my question is, yes, we know that tech is always evolving. You know, there's new innovations coming up. I think every month or even every day, right? And as comms, we usually want to kind of be at the forefront of these developments, comms wise, right? Communicating what's like winning the race. Um, but I find that maybe, you know, internal stakeholders might not be aligned. So I think it could be because, um, I don't know, simply because the internal tech development itself is not there yet. For example, if we're talking about um, I had a client that we really wanted to talk about AI about, mm -hmm. but they're like, oh, we're just not there yet. Yeah. Then how do you as um, you know, tech comes, how do you win this race in terms of communicating what's relevant to the media, what's relevant to the market, but still manage your internal stakeholders and sticking to the truth as much as possible? I think it's a chicken and egg thing, right? You mm -hmm. can't pitch something to the media if your product exactly. is not ready, <laughs> right? So again, you know, that would be a little bit more creative with how you want to be working with your client. So the product might not be ready, but the thinking behind trying to build their product, mm -hmm. uh, for example, could be ready. Like, you know, they could be working on a documentation to look at uh, ethical AI. The product is not ready, but they talk about how they can ensure that if whenever the product is ready, it is safe, it is secure, it is ethical, for example. So that is an area that your client could possibly cover instead mm -hmm. of the, the product itself. Yeah. I think it's important to know sort of... Um your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, know which areas that you can play in, which areas you can feature strongly in. Um, and then the ones that, and you start small, right? You start small in those areas and then you slowly build up. Um, and also to realize that in the areas that you cannot like comment in, you cannot sort of, you know, show up at the way that you want, just don't. Yeah, I think there's a, I think comms is a very like, um, I don't know how to describe it. I think it's a very fine line between, you know, everybody is like, oh, you know, we should be talking about this. We should jump on this. But no, you don't always have to um, because it doesn't make sense for your company. I hate those, the, on LinkedIn, I hate those, you know, some Thanks. events. No, no, some, there's some <laughs> event that's happening and then someone, you know, a communication specialist mm -hmm. jumps on there and writes a post like the three lessons that you should learn from what happened. It's like, Sometimes I just think um, stuff has to happen organically right. and, and not everything is a learning experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're working at a place that has literally a technology that nobody really understands except the people who, quantum yes, quantum computing. <laughs> so, so like, you know, AI is, is everyone's talking about it right now. And, you know, before it was crypto and NFTs. So it's when the stuff becomes kind of mainstream because the media gloms onto it and starts yapping about it. Mm -hmm. um, then it's almost too late in a way to explain it. And I, I sort of feel like getting ahead of the curve on something like quantum computing, what is it? Why does it matter? By the time the products are ready to come out to the market, then you have an audience that understands what you do and they're more interested in your brand yeah. and your service and your product because they understand what underlies it because you've spent a lot of time working with media and your own channels and explaining what it is and why it matters to them. That's the main thing. How does it change my life and make things better? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other? Yes? I have a question for you, Ali, and then also Me? Yeah, your I'm business. not a panelist. That's right. It's still setting up there. <laughs> um, not you first. Um, you were at Tencent when a lot of geopolitical kind of issues. I'm talking more about what happened in India and a lot of games were banned. Yeah, 59, I think. How, how did that, how did, how did you deal with that from your side in terms of that crisis? And then, Duck and cover. you've written about Tencent games and Tencent, and you've written a kind of, one of your headlines earlier was that um, Tencent's growth was driven by games, and this is before that, obviously. So, how did your engagement change when you were dealing with Tencent? Um, and how did their messaging change from your perspective as well? Right. So, I'm sorry, just one more thing. You mentioned earlier that agencies can't choose their clients. You absolutely can as a former agency head. Have what? 
We mentioned that Asian oh, can choose. Okay. Can be kind of, you must be from a big Asian person. thing. Yeah. yeah. Some of yeah. the agency in the US, we can. Anyone who's a junior person, reminder that your bosses, they can choose what clients they want. You can't say no to clients. And mm -hmm. anyone who's an agency head and makes a choice about our clients, like own, own that decision. You can choose it for a growth or from which it's fine. Just own it. Um, I think you can mitigate. <clears throat> so what you're facing is two governments that don't get along with each other or disagree. Something that actually is happening in the real world is affecting your business there. It's not directly a, you know, a reflection of Tencent. Um, you know, one thing is that's when you really want to have good public affairs people, you know, government affairs people uh, operating long before there's any kind of conflict and long after the conflict's going on and you find a way to ease back into the market. Um, it's a compliance issue ultimately because whether or not it was triggered by geopolitics, you still have to find your way back in because you were banned. So, you know, is it better to have a partnership with someone else? How can we help that market? You know, there are a lot of considerations, but the point is, you know, you can't just rush in with a press release and make everything better. It, it really takes time to understand what's the source of the problem and how uh, amenable is the party that banned you or your, you know, your services and your products to finding other ways to let you back in, or is it really like door shut forever? Your question for me is specific to answer. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, given that he, not just sitting right next to you, but if you have general observations about how that kind of relationship or how that how that changed, um, especially in the last couple of years because of geopolitics, I'd be interested. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh. So I like covering geopolitical stuff because I don't think we get enough of it in local media for obvious reasons. Uh, and because I'm not in the mainstream media, I get some deep, I believe I get some deep away. Uh, in discussing geopolitical issues a little bit. And I feel also being on a on a global media platform that is largely US driven, that I want to make, help balance uh, perspective a little bit by being one of the few Asian, uh, as in the few writers that write Asian stuff for them. Um, and because of that, I take that very seriously. So I do cover geopolitical. I feel that there's so much um, non-Asian views right now that's going on in the media that we need to try to balance it a little bit. But it's a bit tricky when it comes to like maybe Tencent and China, China companies. So let me give you a little bit of a uh, personal uh, behind the scenes story. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, so there was a time when China tech companies were a little afraid to talk about when chat became huge, right? And everyone was talking about Gen AI, and you know that all the all the US companies were fighting to be one of the first to come and say, oh, we are into Gen AI. But the China companies were, interestingly enough, very quiet. And we know that they're working on something. And I actually met Tencent, not the games the division, that's why you went there. So um, I think Tencent Cloud. Um, and I did ask about whether they had plans for Gen AI. And at that time, I suspected that they couldn't say much because they were afraid that if they said too much, then the regulations might come down. Because we didn't know at that time yet, or they didn't know at that time yet, how the government, Chinese government specifically, was going to handle how data should be managed in terms of Gen AI training, data scraping, stuff like that. So, and I think for that reason, the Chinese tech companies were really quiet about their Gen AI plans. And once the government came in and said that, we're going to let you go ahead and do, but with some guidelines, then you start seeing people like Alibaba, Tencent, um, what's the other one? Baidu. Baidu yeah. Thank you. The, they, they started coming up, as you can probably read from the headlines, that they're all now into Gen AI stuff. And they all have their own large language models training as well. So that's, that's really, I just make sure that if they're not able to talk at the moment, I kind of know why, and but I still have to try so in my headline for one of the Tencent stories was that they are really big into like uh, metaverse, for instance, and they were at the time that was what the press conference was about, but coy on Gen AI. Because you know that the readers want to know, and but you know that the spokespeople can't say, but you know that as a reporter, you have to ask and then report what they say. And that's how I try to balance it. And then when once they're ready to say something about it, just go hard on it. Hard as in ask them the questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I guess we're all here. 
you can just hang out and ask more questions offline with them. Any last words? Enjoy the dream. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the rest. Thank you.